Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Silverstrom. I work for uh, Adobe, and the project I work on is the Adobe Experience Platform. Uh, the Adobe Experience Platform is a platform for marketing operations. Uh, we bring together your marketing uh, information and working with a lot of data. And so it's a pretty exciting opportunity uh, to work with so much data and, and large advertisers around the world. And today, I wanted to talk to you about uh, automated uh, data set monitoring. Uh, the quality and the integrity of the data that we work on is first and foremost for us and for our partners. And so it is critical that we're uh, approaching this with best practices and with the latest developments in the industry. From the standpoint of the Adobe Experience Platform, uh, a lot of what you're going to hear about uh, in in the, in the media right now is around customer customer journey analytics. Customer journey analytics enables you to connect all of your customers' data together. Right. What we are seeing right now in the industry is that over time, we end up having islands of information. We have some of the some of the partners have data in their in their CRM system, other partners have their data in the web analytics system. And our goal is to bring together all of these different data elements for a single comprehensive view of the customer. This comprehensive view of the customer can be used in multiple ways. The specific way we're talking about here with customer journey analytics is exploring the customer's journey understanding what the customer has done as they've uh, begun using the product, uh, the different steps that they went through along the way. And so without any further ado, I would encourage you to enjoy the following video that uh, we prepared, which gives you a good idea of what the customer journey analytics experience is like. Have you ever received a completely irrelevant communication from a business that you've had some or even a lot of history with? Like an email offering you a discount on something you just paid full price for. Because customer data is collected from so many different devices and channels, it's hard to connect it all. Data either ends up in silos or centralized in a data lake. Either way, customer data fragments are rarely assembled into customer profiles resulting in a disconnected view of journeys and bad customer experiences. Adobe fixes that with customer journey analytics. It not only brings all your data together into individual customer profiles, it makes insights completely accessible to anyone that needs to make sure journeys flow seamlessly and customers feel valued. Powered by Adobe Experience Platform, customer journey analytics completely connects and stores all your customer experience data in one place based on a common design. You can create a seamless process for describing customer interactions consistently across various touch points. It greatly reduces data preparation and the number of ad hoc requests for insights, saving analysts and data science teams countless hours of overhead. Customer Journey Analytics lets anyone responsible for the customer experience easily access data and surface insights to get a clear view of the entire customer journey, from acquisition to closed sale and beyond. We do this by bringing the interactive self-service environment of analysis workspace to omni-channel customer data. You can use easy drag and drop visualizations combined with journey-based analysis and attribution tools to get real-time insights into how customers actually engage with your organization. It gives those on the front line of customer experiences the insights they need to deliver the experiences customers need in real time. It's easy to compare customer segments, analyze fallout behavior, and uncover high-performing cross-channel customer journeys. It lets you dig into layered data sets and present insights for different audiences in real time, or use pre-built artificial intelligence and machine learning models to discover hidden insights and influence points along the customer journey. So instead of sending your customer a 25% off code for the item they just bought, you would know they just bought it and could send an offer code for an add-on that would amplify their purchase. Customer Journey Analytics helps you empower your teams to give customers the experiences they'll value and your business the returns it needs. I hope everybody enjoyed the video. Uh, I think they did a, a great job of uh, explaining this. This is definitely not my strong suit doing uh, the, the video. Uh, but I enjoy it when it's done well. And I, and I think what they're really trying to capture in, in our minds is how do we 
kind of bring together all these disparate data sources? How do we uh, bring everything, align those users together, extract the information in order to 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 basically get the insights that you're you're trying to get in order to you know help make your customers happy. I mean that's at the end of the day uh, the goal of uh, all of our customers is how do we make customers happy and and my goal is to making sure that they have the best possible tools in order to do that. So when we think of the data ingestion and, and management of of uh, data within the Adobe Experience platform. Uh, we are at a data lake conference, and so as, as you can imagine, we use a data lake just like everybody else does because there's oftentimes a lot of data. Uh, you can see 233 trillion annual customer data transactions are occurring on the Adobe solutions. That's a lot of data. So when there is so much data, what you're finding is that you're interacting with many different kinds of connectors. You have to have flexible data capture, um, auditors to scan and troubleshoot the problems, integrations with all the partners in the industry. You have have to have Facebook integrations, Google Cloud Platform integrations, AWS Cloud integrations. Like you, you really are in an ecosystem at this point. And the ecosystem of the four marketing operations is, is large. And there is everything from batch, um, you know, you know, hearkening back to the days of, uh, you know, FTP and FTP is still quite frequently uh, used, uh, but FTP is now kind of evolved and we're now looking at more ingest and egress via APIs for, for large batches. Um, the patterns, the schemas, the legacies, the formats, uh, there's a lot of different patterns that are contained within the data that we must support. And this data needs to be brought together into a consistent format so that customers are able to uh, use that data and get the full picture of the, of the customer's profile. To that end, the data preparation phase is a key part of the Adobe Experience Platform because the data and the data integrity on landing needs to be in a very specific pattern in order to map Within to within the data structures that that have been created and the tools that we've created in order to enable these rich insights into the customer profile. So ingestion is a is a critical aspect of how we will be successful with the Adobe Experience Platform. Let's think of all of the places where data ingestion starts. It, it really has a very broad uh, you know, footprint within our modern world of, of where information is coming in, in from. Uh, we can think of everything from the, the uh, IoT, Internet of Things, uh, sending in information, uh, Roku boxes, uh, you know, streaming boxes, uh, Adobe Launch integrations where we're basically doing code React integrations. We have uh, SDKs that deploy on Apple TV, on iOS, on Android. Many different sources of data that are being brought in uh, to the platform. And that data is coming in with varying degrees of, uh, you know, kind of richness, different formats, and bringing that into a format so that it can be, that it can be managed properly is a key aspect of, of our data lake and how we store it and how you can then subsequently query that and use that data. Think of the Adobe solutions. Uh, Adobe includes Adobe Analytics, Adobe Audience Manager, Adobe Target, Adobe Campaign, uh, Adobe iCloud. And uh, that's, I've been working on iCloud before coming to uh, um, the Adobe Experience platform. Third party data, it, it's no longer sufficient anymore to support only your own solution. Uh, this is really an ecosystem that we're looking at, and this ecosystem involves many different players. We then further are working with third-party data coming through ETLs, ELT tools, uh, and partner integrations so that we can integrate with the infrastructure that the customers have in place already. Like, sizable investments have already been made with the current data lake, well, with the current data architecture that's in place, we need to integrate with those architectures in order to be successful. When we think of the store, 
and and how the data is being stored in um, in the Adobe Data Lake. Uh, what we look at is uh, we call it the the XDM, and the XDM store is a JSON schema. Yeah, we it, if you think of the common data model uh, from Microsoft, uh, XDM is the experience data model. It's built around marketing experiences and and uh, you know customer experiences that they may may have, whether it's on you know the Internet of Things and so forth. So the structure of our data lake, the schemas of our data lake are based on JSON schema. And so given that you're transitioning from what are frequently relational models or you know or JSON models and then need to translate these into consistent uh, and specific JSON schema models, that transition is uh, that that's a, a, a lot of the well, uh, where the work goes into in order to to help map that and make sure it's working correctly. And so the data lake contains the data upon ingestion within the model. We have a, what we call a batch ingestion service. The batch ingestion service, uh, you have, a, you have a, a file that gets uploaded. It is what we call the slow path. It basically is, is loading, you know, the loading the data in a batch, you know, could be, uh, you know, several terabytes in size. It could be, you know, you know, a small one, you know, ten kilobyte batch as well. I, it's the same service that's being ingested. We are taking the data, translating that data into the JSON schema format, and then once it's in that JSON schema format, it can then be queried as, as well, just like um, any other data lake. But the key thing is that we are translating uh, the data into the JSON schema and landing that data in that JSON schema structure. And so we frequently run into batch cases. We also run into um, Kafka, Kafka pipelines, ingesting off of a Kafka pipeline, ingesting off of Kinesis, uh, ingesting off of Event Hub, Hub you know, PubSub. Uh, these are all standard technologies uh, for high volume uh, uh, data interactions. And these technologies are uh, potential uh, sources of data from which uh, you can then populate into the Adobe Experience platform. And as you can imagine, uh, we have a, a deep experience with the Adobe Analytics with uh, working with on-device uh, data as well. And so the, the data that is currently being logged within websites, within mobile sites, within um, SDKs, within apps is also coming in. And that can be, come in simply as pixel streams. You know, that is a... You know, frequent use case uh, for for the data to enter the system as well, and that's also being ingested and lands within the data lake as well as within uh, the profile, the unified profile in the JSON schema format. So this is very much the challenge that we have uh, within uh, Adobe Experience Platform is bringing in large volumes of data, ensuring that it is of expected characteristics and that the characteristics of the data itself are correct you know but are we are we basically you know ingesting a you know a lot of data which contains uh, for instance a you know, single identity as opposed to a distribution of identities you know how how do you how do you ensure that um, that uh, an upstream system of which we are seeing the data is providing uh, the expected richness of the data on the on the customer and marketing interactions that we expect and that that's a and you want to do that in an automated way like as, as much fun as it, as it is to review millions millions of records uh, the the key is how how can we affect this in an automated way to help customers um, manage and ensure the quality of the data that's entering the adobe experience in particular i was going to walk through an exercise uh, around the batch ingestion uh, pipeline and uh, what we're going to use is uh, we're going to assume that data is landing via batch into the Adobe Experience platform. And I wanted to walk you through the methodology by which we would Im implement automated data set monitoring on that um, data as it's landing in the platform. So the batch ingestion service, you can think of this as providing validation, transformation, partitioning, and writing to the lake. These are the services that are provided as the data is ingested and lands within Adobe Experience Platform. The sources of the batch data, in, in, in this case, you, you could imagine that this could be uh, um, 
a batch of data that could come from a point of sale terminal. Uh, it could be a batch of data that came from a, a download, you know, an, an extract of a of a information from a CRM system. Uh, there's many different sources where we can get, um, you know, information. It could be an email provider, you know, the list of the emails and the results of those emails, so that it 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 can land and get um, populated into the profile. But the idea is that batch streaming pipelines; these are all you know, ways that we can ingest data. And for batch data, it's it's a common scenario that we run into that customers need to to land their data into Adobe Experience Platform uh, from a batch. Right. So the interactions that we have in order to land the data are all via API, and uh, it's very much an API first in order to lend itself to integration within an open ecosystem. And that, that's that's really key for us. Um, and so. In order to do that integration, you're, you basically are working with JWT, J JSON Web Tokens, as your authentication method. So web standards and trying to comply with the best practices throughout the industry. So when I look at the automated data set monitoring, um, we can assume that in the top of this diagram, that data sources are landing within the Adobe Experience platform. There's ingestion activity across the different uh, services. We see the ADLS, the profile store, the identity store. And when we think of tagging these data sets within our serverless functions to handle the target data sets, what we're effectively saying is that I understand a data source. I understand where it came from. And I'm able to say, this data source is my CRM data source. This is my point of sale terminal data source. And I expect data that enters that data set to have certain characteristics, certain attributes, uh, certain consistency, distribution of values, um, breadth of activity, uh, expected kind of behaviors being observed, right? And that information of kind of that tagging of the data set allows you then to infer behaviors. And when I subsequently get a webhook post, from the Adobe Experience Platform saying that data has been ingested into that particular data set, I then am able to uh, deduce based upon that data set, what are the given tests that need to be run? What checks should be done on that data in order to make sure that it's, it aligns with what the expected behavior of the data is, uh, the expected distribution of values, the expected um, you know, amount of revenue being purchased? Is, you know, are, am I doing, uh, you know, checksums against uh, financial systems, like does this system, you know, does the data that just arrived, is it consistent with the, with the expected amount of uh, information, uh, shape of the data, uh, quantity of the data, sums across the data that, that I'm expecting to see. And so by using this, the webhook methodology, this is uh, pretty common in the, in, in the industry for uh, event-driven pipelines. We are then able to prompt subsequent actions and interrogation of the data. So with that post, I then get detailed batch information. I'm able to query the batch. And then based upon the results of those queries and the detailed information, I can then uh, have subsequent actions. I can send out an alert. I can send out a notification. I can prompt further investigation. And in some cases, I can stop the pipeline. Like it could be a you know, blocking alert, like if you run into this particular alert, that means that the pipeline should stop and subsequent activities should stop. And what you can think about is subsequent activities is that often your data set landing is a, is a prelude to your segment exercises where you develop your audiences and begin fetching your audiences from the data lake, you know, to drive and build up um, the groups, but you need to have the data in place in order before you begin those segmentation exercises. By using a control flow and an event-driven architecture, you're able to create conditional, um, conditional, you know, determination of whether the data pipeline is healthy and should continue along, or it can be run in parallel and inform that information. And the idea is, you, we're never going to be able to totally eliminate all data problems. Like that is uh, not, it's, it's something to wish for, but it's just not reasonable to expect. And the frequency that they occur depends a lot upon, you know, the circumstances, the sources of the data. But 
And, and sometimes it's people who don't quite even realize that they've broken the data or broken the data source. Um, you know, from our experience working with the DMPs and DSPs, you just have a lot of parties participating in the data exchange and it can be inadvertent. And, and all we're trying to do is as quickly as possible, get the customers back up and running and operational with correct data, with everything fixed. And get to that happy place because because frankly all of us are in the same boat we are interested in ensuring uh the customers are working you know we and we as um you know data handlers data data managers data providers all have a common interest in ensuring the customer success and so it's incumbent upon us uh to work with each other for that coming uh for that customer success and so We've also been starting to take the next step of now we update up for monitoring reporting for longer, you know, longer determinations of, of just like, how, you know, what reporting did we see? You know, what data did we see? What patterns did we see? How long are we seeing these patterns? And so for that purposes, I am actually, you know, taking that same data that we're, that we're gathering and, and pushing that back into the data lake in the XDM schema and the JSON schema so that we can analyze it uh, for longer term trends as well as for, for short-term patterns that we're trying to identify uh, within the data set. So let's, let's dig a little bit deeper into this. When we think of a webhook versus an API, I think this is probably the, the, the first piece that we've been uh, educating our, our customers on. APIs are request-based. You're, you're basically polling. You're polling for data, right? And so since you're polling for data, you know that you're you're going to get something back or that you want it. Like, so there is no, it's not so much that you're, you're basically waiting and waiting and waiting. And then, then, then you pull, you like, you typically have a time, time series, 30, every 30 minutes, you're going to pull and find out information. When you think of a webhook, the way to think of it is, is that it is event based webhooks come as a result of some activity occurring within the system. It could be a successful activity Failed activity, any activity in the implementation that we have within um, within Adobe Experience Platform, we use webhooks for notifications of AEP events around our ingestion events, and this is this is pretty much what a what a, what a webhook looks like. Um, this is the what the request that we generate looks like. Um, I, I go to webhook dot site. That's a place that I go to in order to test my webhooks and and uh, make sure that it's sending what we expect. But the kind of headers and information that we see within the request provides information about and you know the origin, the user agent. How do how do we know where this particular webhook came from? This is interesting information when you're receiving that webhook because then you can uh, use this information in order to in, to interpret and understand what that data is. The piece I wanted to point out here is the request body, because within the content of the request body, this is where we're able to derive the particular data set. And you can see that here. You know, you can think of this data set ID as being the place, you know, th this is basically the tag data set, which indicates specific implementation of the data within that particular, you know, think of it as a table, basically. The data set IT represents a certain composition of data. It has certain fields that are expected to be populated. It has a shape. It has a schema. It has patterns of behavior. Uh, the concept between behind the ingestion ID, this represents the specific ingestion activity into that particular data set ID. Uh, you'll frequently also hear these referred to as batches. And these batches represent a, an atomic Kind of activity, and since these this is a batch ingestion, it actually represents the entire uh, file and and the information that was um, that was introduced into the data set, and so it very much represents an atomic operation. Like this batch contains this particular um, set of information. Okay, so these two pieces of information are critical because the data set ID tells me how I should expect the data to be. Like, you know, what is the schema? You know, this is the tagging process. I've, I've tagged this data set and I understand what should be in that, in that data set. And then the specific in, um, ingestion ID gives me the handle to say, ah, pull data for that particular atomic operation that just occurred, right? So these are two, uh, you know, kind of 
you know, critical pieces of information that we're, that we're pulling out of, uh, out of the, out of the web hook. And using this web hook derived information, what we're then able to do is we're able to basically pull in, uh, the metrics, the number of records, the size, the start time, the end time, the behaviors, you know, do we, do we see failures? Well, how many failures were there? Um, we have the concept of validation and, you know, what point at what, you know, percentage of the, you know, invalid um, characters or records should we fail a particular batch? Because um, these are the challenges of the internet. We have data sources that are generated on, on device via JavaScript, via browsers that contain bad data. Like, and what's the threshold that we want to accept before we reject the entire batch out of hand, right? So, once we have the batch information, we're able to then drive into the specific ingestion locations. We're you know, driving the data into the data lake, into the da various identity and data store forms. And this information informs the health, you know, the basic health. You know, do we feel like this was a successful ingestion purely from uh, you know, the logistics standpoint? You know, was the service able to validate and land the data, right? Now note, this does not have any indication of the, of the shape, although you can do uh, format validation as part of JSON schema. For instance, like URI is a, is a very common one that we run into. Um, if, if, the, if, if you have a specific field, you know, defined within your, X, within your XDM schema and are requiring that that be a URL, uh, we can, verify that yes it looks like it's a valid url it has it has the the character set for a valid url and is it acceptable right and so that level of json schema validation is, is definitely acceptable now the challenge comes when you're like well it's a valid url but is this a, a url that is even within the sites that we expect them to be right is this coming from a you know, from, from our own website, is it coming from a different host than we expected? And that's the point where we begin the next layer of validation of, okay, it was a, an acceptable format of data, but is the data representing and reflecting what we are expecting to see entering into the system? You know, is that URL coming from a host? That we're expecting to see data from, and if it, if not, what is that host? Is that an indication of a problem? Is it an indication of a change in the system that we may not be aware of? Uh, how should we interpret that information? How, how should we change our processes as a result of that? What is the implications of that? Does it in, indicate that different you know customer journey is occurring? And as a data engineer, you're often you know sometimes the the last to know that UI changes have occurred on the website. So sometimes you're like, oh, I didn't know that that page is in there, and and the validation is really handy from that standpoint. So it, the key aspect that you're thinking of is you're using this system to give you a top level view of are my formats correct or is my validation correct? And next, you're beginning to query the data to get deeper insight, to figure out exactly what is uh, landing within the data set. What is the shape of that? What are, what are the characteristics of that data that, that I need to check that provide me insight? And how do I query that? Like, you know, how, do, how should I think of, 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 of deriving that information, right? Because when we think of the querying the batch, what we're really looking at is um, it's a, a SQL-based system, right? The data lake for Adobe Experience Platform, we run SQL. You run SQL uh, against your data sets, and you're able to, uh, it's uh, more of a MapReduce style uh, query. You know, the, we use data, Databricks as a, as a provider, and uh, uh, I've been, I had been using Kubel for a long time as well for similar, similar possibilities, right? I mean, you have the Presto engine, you have the Hive engine. I mean, this is all Spark SQL. Uh, you know, it's kind of the latest that we're using right now. But when we query the batch, what we're doing is we're using the API. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, using APIs to query Kubel and uh, query data sets, this is all very familiar. Uh, our query service driver is a Postgres driver. We're using the JWT uh, as our 
as our authentication method in order to get our access token. Uh, this is in industry standard. And um, my preference is using Python. So what you're seeing here is I'm creating a data frame using the results from my query. And what we're effectively doing in this one is just the, a pure count. You know, give me a count of what I see materialized within the data lake. And ideally, this is exactly the same count as that we're seeing from the from the validation. But you can imagine that other queries can be formulated that, to provide further insights in in into the data set as well. Uh, the the idea is how do I get information out of the data lake, run queries against that that provide me those insights, and from there, what is what is the next step? You know, how do how do I then take that information and make that make that actionable? One of our one, one of our favorite actions that we that we did, and we've been doing this for a while, was uh, basic anomaly detection. Like, a, you know, the idea of a standard deviation and uh, and the ability to to use SQL for analytics, you know, for the ANSI analytics is is very powerful. What I'm demonstrating here is the use of the, the standard dev underscore pop uh, uh, function, which basically provides, you know, given a population, what is the standard deviation of that population? And that you can see that at the bottom, and at the bottom, we're also taking the average, right? And I'm basically building a top, you know, an upper bound and a lower bound using that standard deviation. From the average, I'm basically saying, give me two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below. And the idea is that 96% of the time, we expect a new incoming uh, record or account or value to be within that, assuming a normal distribution of the, of the values, which is tends to be pretty, works, works out pretty well uh, for the data patterns that, that we encounter. Um, and so what you're then seeing is just a case determination of, is it low, is it high, um, or does, is it okay? Is it falling within those bounds? And so basic anomaly detection using uh, SQL is a very powerful method of providing uh, some characteristics on sums, on average, on revenue, on uh, unique counts of distinct new users within a given hour, right? And sometimes you have to add periodicity into it and start getting into old winners and uh, give me for the same hour, you know, for the last seven days versus, uh, you know, the overall for the, uh, you know, for the last seven days. And so the, the idea is that you can modify your queries in, um, in, a, in a way to identify the patterns based upon where you're minimizing, your, minimizing the noise and the false positives. And really trying to drill in when there are actually are issues and patterns in the data uh, which require attention. Okay. So once I determine that there is an anomaly, uh, the the next step is really the kind of the alerting and notifications. And what we've been working on within Adobe is like I need to get this into Slack. You know, we use Slack a lot. Uh, I want to get this into a Slack notification, and there's a a system for uh, delivering a Slack message via HTTP post. You can slack in the message, you know, from your from your Python, say, hey, the, you know, I, I noticed this pattern. I noticed an anomaly in this particular batch being loaded into this particular data set. Uh, in, in more extreme cases, we're sending it into pager duty. You know, we want to wake somebody up in the middle of the night and say, hey, you know, something bad went wrong uh, here. We we need a we need immediate attention on on this particular uh, you know, data set on, the, on this issue uh, requires immediate attention. And then we're also saving this within the data lake. And within the data lake, we then can point Tableau, Power BI, Looker, you know, pick your favorite BI tool, um, pick Dash and Plotly and write some Python and, uh, and build your own dashboards. You know, take your pick. Uh, anything that accepts a, any, any system with a Postgres driver can, can pull data from the Adobe Experience Platform data lake. But the idea is to basically kind of make make that data mobile, make it actionable, make it retrievable, so that customers can get the insights that they need in order to have confidence that their system is running healthy, right? And and accepting the behaviors that they expect, because this is then driving subsequent segmentation activities 
and and business for the customer. And you will see, and most of us have experienced that typically it's uh, the, the the failure patterns come back as a result of the results of the as a result of the marketing activity. Like, why did that marketing activity went um, go wrong? And at that point, identifying data sets that are critical that have certain behaviors that we want to watch for, adding new queries to run through those, and in some cases, sampling for high volume data sets. But how do you iterate through to get greater and greater confidence that your data set ingestion, as it's ingesting into the Adobe Explainer Experience platform, is not going to adversely impact um, the marketing results? How do we know we have clean, good data? And if we find that we, ha we have a, a pattern that of concern, how do we get that information into the right person's hands, allow them to then analyze that data and you know, pull that data down, uh, you know, further investigate it, look at the source of the data, check the provenance, understand exactly how that data came in or where did the problem you know, enter into that, you know, that caused the issue that we're identifying within the data. And remedy that, and then and then fix the fix the um, data pipeline. So, this is very much how we are using uh, the uh, you know kind of the automated data set monitoring in order to provide greater confidence to our customers that the data is landing and that our data pipelines are healthy. When I think of the key takeaways, there there's a few takeaways I I, I have, and they're and they're pretty straightforward. And when I think of the Adobe Experience Platform, you know. By leveraging an event-driven pattern, uh, the event-driven patterns are uh, m much preferred compared to the uh, polling-based patterns. I, in my career, I've used, used them both. The advantage of the event-driven patterns is that you begin developing this capability of, of you know, I think of you know, directed acyclic graphs, you know, the DAG approach within Airflow, where you basically are able to you know, have this series of events that are expected to occur in order and be successful one after the other. Uh, the timeliness that you're able to get by getting that notification can be critical. Um, we have large data sets that can take 12, 13, 14 hours to complete, all right? And when it takes that long to complete a job, you want to be notified as soon as possible, like, like, hey, like something went wrong with that job or we need to retry that so that we can try to get the data pipeline back on track and and into in, in into the you know conformity you know i mean what we're basically trying to do is we want nominal performance we need to make sure that their the data is being processed as expected with the expected values with the expected data quality and we want to be notified promptly uh, when it's outside of those uh, operating operating uh, boundaries one handy piece of this is using serverless. I found you know the serverless technologies have been achieving greater and greater adoption. I feel within the the industry, and as we use serverless technologies, the the life cycle of the checks of of the determinations is a, is quite amenable for monitoring uh, use cases. Uh, in general, the amount of data that is being kind of brought back and, and analyzed. Um, within our code is relatively small and, and fits perfectly well within um, within our within our containers, uh, and it is also amenable to interfacing and, and working with our alerting and monitoring systems. You know the kind of the uh, transient lifecycle of the of the container is not an issue because we're able to log the information that we need, understand when it ran, what were the results when it ran. Uh, we can reconcile that with the behavior that we see within the data lake in terms of the queries that are being executed. So this methodology and technology has been very been working out uh, well for us in terms of uh, our, our monitoring techniques. And then lastly, I kind of go back to the you know the open ecosystem. Uh, when I think of the open ecosystem, I think I really think about how do we make products that work well together, that integrate together. And things like, you know, the APIs, SQL, um, you know, the Postgres driver, uh, common technologies that people are, that are approachable, that, um, that technologists are familiar with. And also just lowering the, lowering those, you know, kind of the, the barriers to, uh, to bringing the information together and, and collecting the information, in, in my opinion, is from a technical standpoint, 
is is key. Uh, there's there's enough complexity. The complexity purely from having you know so many data sources alone is is a is a challenge. Uh, reducing the complexity of the tools that we're using, um, you know, keep it really, really simple is, is really the, you know, the marching orders that we want to have when we're building data pipelines and, and monitoring because there's complexity, inevitably comp complexity with the interactions. So using simple to operate, simple to diagnose and understand systems enables you to then kind of, you know, empower your customers to understand what's going on. You know, what was the code that we ran? I'm a, I'm a big fan of making sure that all this code is open source and, and getting this in the hands of all of our, of, of our customers because at the end of the day, a happy customer is one that is successful with their efforts. And to make them successful with their efforts, we need to really you know, empower our engineers that we're working with to give them the tools that they need in order to, to be successful on their own, you know, self-service uh, successful and able to understand and diagnose uh, problems within their system. Uh, without needing to refer over to to our support teams or um, escalate or you know or get problems and, and grow their skill set and learn learn the technologies and and build a brand new cool stuff on top of them that are gonna amaze our customers and you know it's good for everyone when that happens at this point I I, I could talk some more about uh, uh, data pipelines and monitoring and uh, all, all the great things that that are happening, but I'd say that I, d I definitely wanted to take a moment to you know thank you know members of my team you know Santosh Nila, Zephan B, uh, Chol Garong, uh, Ryan Blair, uh, the great teammates, and enjoy working with them and appreciate all their hard work um, putting up with my you know, you know pretty specific guidance in terms of how things should be done in terms of the monitoring and, and just understanding. You know, what is what is the best practice and how do we develop best practices and following those and you know the support of our leadership within the Adobe Experience platform you know, I, I've been excited to you know work with uh, uh, Anjul, uh you know Santi Holt camp and Stephen Sid had some great leadership you know over the last uh, several years and uh, I've learned a lot and there are some great members on the team and I look I'm always impressed with uh, the, the new technology that they have and, and uh, the consistent efforts of everyone uh, to, to really try to make our customers happy and, and build great, great products. So uh, what I am looking forward to is working more with Kubel. I've been working with Kubel for a long time prior to coming to the Adobe Experience Platform, and I'm excited that the Adobe Experience Platform is at that point where we can uh, better understand what those interactions are within the open, open ecosystem. and uh, look forward to you know working with them and and using these tools in order to make all of our customers happy. So that that's about all I had for today, and I uh, look forward to hearing from any, anyone if you have any questions. Thank you.